Welcome back to Riders of the Dawn. This is Stu. This is Jay. And today we're going to talk about... What are we going to talk about, Jay? Um, let's see. How, how should we title this? Um, how to be a bad rider and get is, is <laughs> Is quality better than quantity in terms of product? Let's, let's put it this way. What, what are readers after? Are readers after good writing? Question. Question. Our readers that's after good writing. Good. That is a good question. Um, so I, I think we should start out with with how this topic came about. Um, we've mentioned the name Derek Murphy a couple times on this podcast, who uh, runs a lot of websites, but one of the most notable being uh, Creative Indie. And uh, Derek Murphy, in addition to being um, a successful indie published author, uh, has been in the marketing business for books. For, yeah, for like for, 10 years. For, yeah, I think 10 years is what he says. So he designs book covers, and part of that service used to be, if you if you got a book cover with him, he had a full marketing service. Yeah. So he would tell you how to promote the book and how to run your, basically how to run your campaigns and everything, and, and how to spend your advertising money, so you got a lot of, um, basically you got a lot of benefit from your advertising. Yeah. Um, rather than what it uh, it is right now for most people, which is that you're um, you're advertising at best is like a one to one. That's how most people look at it. It's like, yeah. or they it, it, it's in the negative, and then they wonder why. Now, he used to be able to to tell you how to do it, so it wasn't that one to one. Like one dollar spent, one dollar returned. It was like you know, two to one, three to one. That's yeah. that's what you want from advertising. You want to make money. You don't want to. Yeah, you don't. Want you don't want to just break even because yeah. there's not a lot of point to that. Um, so one thing, the, the thing that I want to, I want to hit is, um, and it, it's something that he says a lot is people will forgive bad writing for a good story. Yeah. And he'll say, you know, people don't remember the writing. They'll remember these individual scenes that mean something to them. Yeah. Which is also another thing, which is like, oh, your, you know, your story <laughs> structure, even if it's off. If you have the meat, if you have the meat of the story in the scenes, people will forgive the fact that like the pacing's off or like, yeah. you know, that the the third act is too short or something like that. They're really gonna pe- readers can be very forgiving if you can be effective, yeah. if if you can affect them somehow and make them feel an emotion. That's what they're gonna really remember. Yeah. Um. So, not only that, but there's. There's something that I think a lot of writers struggle with, and it's their it's their prose. It's how their sentences are, are put together. It's how um, uh, you know each. Uh, if you're if you're a perfectionist like me, you think about what every single word means, and that means that your word count suffers tremendously. Yeah. Um, but in reality, the your audience, your reader, is not going to care so much about your polish as much as they're going to care about your story. So I. When I've, when I've said this to people, not on the podcast, because obviously Stu agrees with me and agrees with everything I say. Um, yes. <laughs> there's a... Uh, of course, Master! <laughs> there's uh, there's always this like, well, that seems counterintuitive. Why would why would people... Why would why would you want to put out a book that that isn't your best work? And that's, that's again, it's kind of the narrative that people write for, them, for themselves or they write for you. Why would you want to put out a bad book? Which uh, it's like, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to put out. Yeah, a you want to put out a good book. You want to put out, obviously. But, so. but yeah, it's like, oh no, of course, writing good writing is what matters, is what a lot of people think. And I'm like, let's look at the evidence. Let's go look at the evidence. All right. So, uh, you know, Twilight, one of the best-selling book series now of all time. Yeah. Uh, terribly written. Yes. Terribly written in every facet that I can talk about. In something being terribly written. The prose is terrible. The language is terrible. Uh, the structure is terrible. There's even like really dumb little gimmicks in some of the books that that are that are just cringy. It's a yeah. cringy thing, but but people ate it up people because it presented a story that people really wanted to read, mm-hmm. and it presented it frankly in a fashion that if it had been well written, less people would have read it. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you can even take for you can jump off of that and look at Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, yeah. Which was Twilight fan fiction that has sold millions of copies, right? Um, and of course, that's that's even in a separate genre. 
So you, <laughs> you go from like, uh, like young adult, young adult, young, young adult, adult uh -huh. paranormal romance to just like, just romance, like erotica, bad erotica. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, but but I mean, see, but the thing is, like Fifty Shades, Fifty Shades was a mega success because it got people who weren't in that genre to buy something in that genre. And you should not yeah. actually ex ever expect to do that. Yeah. Um, you should you should expect the people, I mean, what you should go for is the people that are in a genre, read that genre a lot, to then hopefully buy your book in that genre. That's what you should go for. Because that's that's the market, right? That If you're starting with the market, you get to do that. And for this, it started as a, a really a no correct market with, with uh, Fifty Shades. And it's like it wasn't in the erotica market and it wasn't really in the young adult twilight market, but somehow it ended up hitting a different market that was maybe both of those. Yeah. Somehow. Anyway, it, it was it, like it was like the the mothers of the people who read twilight. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think the goal the goal is you have to build your audience, and part of building your audience is giving them value. So, to give them value, you have to be creating products. So, part of this part of this idea that people will forgive bad writing for a good story is, as as an author, especially as an independent author, you have to you have to put products out. Uh, otherwise, uh, your one book is never going to sell. Yeah. So, I, I've been I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, if you're a YouTuber, you're not going to get a million views on your first video. Maybe after, maybe after five years and thousands of videos, you'll yeah. that first video will hit a million. But if you put out one video, and it doesn't matter how well produced that one video is, you're not going to get a lot of views um, without like a tremendous amount of spending in uh, in advertisement. So, um, like, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? So, PewDiePie doesn't do any advertising. But he puts out, I mean, at one point he was putting out two or three videos a day. Now yeah, he's, and all hitting millions of views. Yeah, and all hitting millions of Well, now especially hitting millions of views. But when he started, he wasn't doing any advertising. He, he built his audience by giving them a product that they wanted. Yeah. Or, or giving a product, and then the people who wanted that product found it, really. Yeah. And um, now it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and of course there's there's been all this this headache with uh, with YouTube advertisers dropping from PewDiePie, but um, people still flock by the millions to go watch his videos. Yeah. Uh, whereas um, Leah Dunham puts out a Kickstarter to talk about how misogynistic games are and she makes like 10 videos no you're not Liam you're thinking of uh, uh, thinking Anita of? Sarkeesian Anita not Sarkeesian Anita yeah Anita, Anita Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian excuse me sorry god what a uh, god, what a what a rip off she yeah. is yeah, Anita she, Sarkeesian she raises like hundreds of thousands of dollars to talk about how misogynistic games are and makes two videos after that yeah so <laughs> and then comes up with another kickstarter <sighs> to do the same thing everyday women it's like, how stupid are people? It's like, apparently, like, in that demographic, they're pretty stupid. Well, but the, the point is, it's like, okay, that those two videos, um, when you when you compare the, the cost analysis, you know, how much, if she raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, how many views did she get? What was, the what was the return on that investment? It wasn't. If you if you invested yeah. in that Kickstarter, it was completely was ideological. Video. You weren't expecting for that. I mean, maybe you were. It had, it had like less views than like a typical, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, a typical yeah. like low tier YouTuber. Yeah. We can't. So, I think there's less views on those than on like I don't know my Star Wars video. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to, to bring it back here. If you are again, if you're just sitting in front of your camera, talking into your microphone, into your into your camera about something that you're passionate about, is it a good production? 
the production value may, might not be very high, but do, but is it something that people want to see? Is it something that people want to hear? Is it something that people want to read? So, and in, and in a lot of cases, again, you look at PewDiePie, it's just him sitting in front of a camera, and now he does have a lot of editors, and he has a lot of time to make the jokes and things like that. The production value isn't really high. Yeah. <laughs> Especially compared to... I mean, compared to anything, like, it's not a sitcom with a set and actors and yeah. multi-cameras and a live audience and whatever else. So the production, I mean, this is why, this is one of the reasons why PewDiePie makes so much money is that his overhead is pretty much nothing yeah. compared to the return. Like, the return is insane. Yeah. And the thing is, people forgive the fact that, that this guy's not not doing traditional stand-up routine or that he's not doing a sitcom or something because they like the content. You know, they forgive the fact that he's not sitting in, like, some fancy studio uh, with cameras, like, panning around him, sitting behind a desk. Like, I see the sets that they built even for, like, Blizzard, you know, Blizzard eSports stuff. And I'm like, what market are you talking to? Because, like, gamers don't care about that. They only care about the gaming content. So, uh, PewDiePie was the first to really realize that, like, no one really cared about that. You didn't have to spend that money on it. If you just had really good gaming content, good commentary, people wanted to see it. Yeah. So, again, the same thing goes for your writing. And if, you, if you're if you spending so much time thinking about every, you know, you're, you're, if you're, first of all, if you're comparing yourself to Stephen King or Brandon Sanderson or Robert Jordan or who else? Michael Crichton. Uh, anyone. <laughs> anyone. If you're comparing yourself to someone like that, of course you're going to be like, you're going to be hyper nitpicky about your product. Um, you got to keep in mind, like, okay, so let's talk about Stephen King real quick, though. Okay. There's a lot of people that are going to say Stephen King's a bad writer. And they won't be wrong in a lot of cases. Frankly, I've read a lot of Stephen King books, and not all of them have been good. I've read a lot of Stephen King books. I don't even know how many I've read. 40? at least, right? I've read, a, yeah. I've read a lot of his books. And not all of them are good. Not all of them are well-written. And in some cases, his most popular books are the ones that I consider to have the, some of the worst writing in them. Mm-hmm. You know, like It, It is way too long for what's in it. <laughs> it's way, it is. It's just, yeah. there's not, there's way more pages than there are content. Way more. But because of how people felt about those characters in It, because they felt, um, they felt, you know, when when I, whatever the boy's name is, Butch or whatever, is trying to like carve the name into the guy's belly, that like invokes such a visceral feeling in people that they remember that scene. Even I remember it. Even even through all the slogging through all the other mess, that didn't make any sense or have anything to do with anything, right? Like honestly, Stephen King could have cut, and that's considered his best book by a lot of people. And it's not to me. It's not because the writing's good. Like yeah. if we're going by his good writing, it's going to be one of his other books. Yeah, it just is. Um, but that one's like it's really effective with people because it has all the imagery that people that that like have this emotional give people this this really tight emotional reaction. Um, so it, it that's a really good example. Is Stephen King the best writer? No, he's not. And frankly, Michael Crichton's not the best writer either. And 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 maybe we should qualify like what is good writing? Because we keep talking about is writing good, is writing bad. Prose. <laughs> so let's start with prose. Yeah. You know what? Before we do that, let me finish my point. Okay. Let me finish my point because the what what people get so focused on is is the the quality over the quantity. And if you're if that's your mindset, and I, again, I'm not telling you to ignore quality. I'm saying that the, the things that are going to make something speak to a reader is not the quality that you're thinking. of. Um, and if you don't have many, 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 many products for people to have consumer confidence about, then it doesn't matter. So again, no one's going to watch your YouTube channel if you have one video that you spend a yes, million dollars on. But if you have, if you have a thousand videos, people are going to come check you out, and it doesn't matter how much money you, you've invested. You could spend ten cents for, per video, you know. And what I really want you to think about, especially indie authors, is when you, don't think about money. Think about your time because your time is your money. If yeah. you're spending, if you spend five years working on one novel and you put it out, you're never going to write another novel because no one's going to read it. 
It's your first. Yeah, album. you're gonna you're gonna get like crushed. You're gonna, you're gonna be, feel crushed. You're gonna feel crushed, and that's really what I'm getting at. And so it doesn't matter. We we could quantify good or bad writing all day long, but what matters is you need to put products out, and you need to get out of your head and just enjoy the process because that's really what's going to make you successful. It doesn't matter. You could, you know, there's there's kind of an acceptable amount of of typo errors that you can have in a manuscript. But and there's typos in... There's typos in, in everything. everything. There's typos in Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings have been published in a million edition, editions. I go back and read it. I'm like, oh, there's typos all through it. There's typos all through Lord of the Rings. There's typos yeah. in... Every published book, every main, mainstream published book I've ever I've ever yeah. read, there's typos in it. I was reading a Tolkien book. I was reading a, a Tolkien fairy tale book to my son last night. There was multiple typographic effort, a, 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 errors, yeah. places where they put the they put the paragraph return in the wrong place. They forgot quote marks. That's a big one. Like quote marks yeah. are missing all over the place yeah. when you typeset this because a typesetter just that's an easy mistake. I think is yeah. the quotes. Uh, so there's there's always going to be typographical errors. You got to let that yeah. go. The luck, and the other thing is, typos are not the errors you should focus on. Yeah. <laughs> you should focus on different errors that stick out to a reader. Yeah. Um, which is like having bad sentences. And, you should fix the sentence structure. And continuity yeah. errors. Yeah. Yeah. Because one thing, I mean, I'm sure if you're on social media, you've seen this. You've seen this image floating around. It's like where the words are are they have the first and the last letter the same in the correct placement but all the letters in between are all mixed up and but you can still read the word yeah your brain's a really good correction mechanism it's also why you're really bad at, at proofreading your own manuscript yes. by the way yeah. so because you will autocorrect your brain will autocorrect in the processing of every single sentence and you literally won't see the typos yeah. you have to have somebody who's not used to what you're writing do it yeah. and that's that's where you're going to catch a lot of the typos yeah. it's a good thing okay? yeah. it's definitely a good thing um so, I mean, let's talk about. So, we. The, the point is, you got to have stuff out, and this is. Um, here's something with if you if you spend a bunch of time and you write your first novel, you, and then you you decide I'm going to get this I'm going to do something with this novel before I do my next book, and you send it out to agents, and you're going to get a lot of rejection letters because the business is really tough right now, especially traditional publishing. So you're going to get a lot of rejection letters before they even look at your manuscript. They're going to look at the story and be like, eh, we don't want to publish it. I'm not interested. Um, you're just going to get a lot of rejection letters. And then you're going to feel really crushed. So you, maybe you're like, well, maybe I'll put it out independently. And then no one buys it because you're like, wait a minute, how do I get people to buy a book? So you spend a bunch of money in advertising and, and it ranks up a little bit. And then a bunch of three and two star reviews start coming back in, and you're like, "Oh my god, I'm terrible at this. I need to quit." Well, it's your first book. Your first your first book is not going to be. It's not going to reflect your best quality. It just isn't. And the other thing is, if you're comparing yourself to someone like Stephen King, Stephen King has the publishing industry behind him. Yeah. Uh, Stephen King will not put out a book that has severe errors because that will be corrected in editing. Someone will go through and say, you know, you got to, you got to edit this stuff. You got to cut this. You got to, you got to fix all this other stuff, and then it'll be fixed long before you ever see it. So when you compare your your draft to Stephen King's published, fully edited manuscript, you're gonna feel a certain amount of. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> I suck at this, right. but that's not the case. Yeah, you, you got to compare comparable individuals. So, and again, I wanna I wanna point out that someone like Derek Murphy, he's not. He's not there yet, but his goal is to be putting out a book every month. Yeah, which is insane. It's it's a. I mean, if you got into writing because you thought you'd have free time, no, <laughs> you're in the <laughs> wrong business. Yeah, um, you better love what you do uh, because you have to be pushing out content. And of course, I'm I am not perfect at this. This is something that I'm learning as I go as well. Uh, you have to you have to offer people content. You have to offer them value, and you have to offer them content. Because, um, so, you know, you're running your website, you have to offer them free content. And you have to hope that that draws people to your website, which then draws them to all the books that you've written. Because if you've only written one, you're not going to hit everybody. And yeah. not only that, your consumer confidence is going to be really low. 
Um, yeah, we I mean, could they, talk about we could talk about reviews too because if you if your book only has five reviews, I mean you're moving in the right direction. Um, but the guys that the guys that are ahead of me are saying you need at least twenty reviews, twenty five reviews. Yeah, you need a, you need like a ten to twenty reviews before you start spending a dime on it. Yeah. And, and that's the point is you have to build a platform before you. And you're going to have to do this in traditional publishing too, guys. Yeah. Traditional publishers are not going to build a platform for you anymore. You're going to have to do that yourself yeah. if you want if you want any success. They might if you front, want to pay back your advance. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> and is, make any money on top is they might they <laughs> might front the money for that advertising, but they're going to take it out of your royalties. So you're still not seeing a dime. So either you can take a loan from a publisher, or you can you can do it. Slow and steady. Yeah, that's so. really where we are in the publishing industry. Yeah, you um, gotta you gotta build a platform. I, my platform's still in the process of being built. I have a platform. I sell books, <laughs> uh, and it's cool. It's really cool when I get a check, and it's like, cool, I sold books. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I don't know. It's it's a long term process. I want to go back to prose though. I want to go back to like okay. what bad writing is because um, it, it's important to focus on the things that are important. So prose is the thing that most people think about with good or bad writing. And um, you have to ask yourself, what is necessary for prose to be functional rather than, quote, good? Because a lot of people want to write florid, complicated sentences that sound beautiful on the tongue. Um, is that necessary to tell your story? I think the answer is no. Um, if you read someone like Ernest Hemingway, you'll see that simple, straightforward language is often extremely effective at telling a story. If you read someone like Elmore, Lin Elmore Leonard, you will find the same thing. Um, if your mind, if you're sitting down writing and you're spending a lot of time coming up with a beautiful compound sentence to express a perfect moment, and you're doing that for every sentence, you're going to be there a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to say, uh, it's okay to have single clause sentences, guys. Is that fact, single clause sentences can be very, very effective because your reader never has to reread them. To understand what you said, if your reader is having to ever reread a sentence, you've you've kind of failed. So it's better to be simple than complex in that case. And if you're spending, if you're sitting down writing, you want to feel like words are going on the page. And if you feel like you, if you feel like something just sounds too kindergarten later, you can always revise it. Yeah. But and you, re remember, if you're if you're so focused on your prose, you're probably you're probably considering the wrong audience. Because if you're trying to impress other writers, that is not your audience. You yeah. Want, you want to. You want to find readers. Yeah. You and want to find people that are interested in that in whatever product you're putting out, whatever story you're telling. And there's a reason that newspapers publish at a fourth grade reading level. Yeah. It's to catch as many people as possible. So. Um, and uh, you know, Michael Moorcock's a great example. Michael Moorcock will say, and he'll talk about this. If if there's a detail that's not present in your mind when you're writing the scene you don't need to write it mm -hmm. you don't need to stop and think about what detail should I include if the details aren't in your mind skip them because if they're not important to you as the story crafter then the reader's probably not going to care about it mm -hmm. and if they do you might catch it in beta reading it's like well you know I really wish you would have described the castle more it's like how important is it to describe the way the castle looks other than like a cursory thing it was big and great most castles look like that, right? Yeah. So you, you have to think about what, what details matter. Um, and main thing is, like, just get the product out. And the other, I mean, and it's easy to focus on the wrong thing when you're thinking about sentence structure and you're not thinking about pacing. Yeah. You know, I've talked about this before, a one-page pacing. Yeah. Something happens every page. If you have something happening every page, then your plot will accelerate forward no matter what. And you can feel it when you're writing. You're like, mm, I'm, I'm spending too long having dialogue. Something needs to happen. Yeah. You know, or I need to have the dialogue say something important. Yeah. And that's that's the way that you should do it. Is like every single page you have something happening. Yeah. And if you're writing in Microsoft Word, single spaced, it's about 500 words. About 500 words is a page. You should have two things happen per page, more or less, because most novels are getting up with about 250 words a page to 300 words a page, depending on the typesetting. Um, and yeah, that's how <laughs> that's how you should think about it. That's a good point. That's yeah. a good point. So when people focus on focus on your characters being good, <laughs> focus on your st yeah. story being good, focus on the plot happening correctly and in an interesting way that people will like to and be interested in hearing about, 
if you focus entirely on prose, I've read so many literary authors and I've met them and I've talked to them and I realized that I've already outsold a lot of them <laughs> yeah. without selling, I don't sell a lot of books, guys. Yeah. But um, they, they focus on the things that English professors think are important, which is like, you know, some particular word choice rather than a story. Or making sure that, that your characters are symbolizing this other thing that has nothing to do with the story. Yeah. Um, symbolism. Uh, more no, symbolism. It, this is, I mean, this is, this is the thing. As a, as a creative person, you're going to be hypercritical about everything you do. Um, pull it back two steps. Let, let the audience be critical. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. And it's really hard to do. It's, <laughs> it's so easy to say because I mean, I know that I do it. Um, and it's something that I'm learning as part of my process to just, I got to let things go because the audience is going to care that I have a product for them more than, you know, this is something we've been talking about with winter sun. So yeah. winter sun, People are like, "Yar, you suck. You're so bad. You ha it took you seven years to come out with this album." And, and then you say, "Well, yeah, but what do you think of it? It's the greatest thing I've ever heard." <laughs> Don't expect that to be you. Yeah, that's not. That's not going to be you. <laughs> I think In most cases. I think we need. But to yeah, we probably need to call it. So um, we are not. You're not going to hear Riders of the Dawn for a couple of weeks, just so y'all know. Um, yeah, we're 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 Jake. going on vacation from from school, and I'm I'm having surgery tomorrow, so. Uh, well, uh, it's nothing serious. You guys don't need to worry about me. I'm, uh, I'm just having a deviated septum fix, and hopefully I'll come back stronger than ever. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is Steve. You can find me at dvspress.com, davidbstewart.com. And this is Jay. You can find me at matthewjwellman.com. And uh, we'll see you next time. Later.